Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's great to see uh, some new faces here and some, some old friends from Refuse Fascism. Uh, my name is J.W. Walker. I am a member of the steering committee for the New York chapter of Refuse Fascism, and I'd like to welcome you all here today to the United Methodist Church of the Village, who have so kindly uh, given us this space this evening. Uh, we're here today to um, discuss a few very, very important questions uh, given the nature of uh, what's going on in our country and in the world. Fascism in America, could it happen here? Is it happening here? What is the danger that the Trump-Pence government poses? Uh, we have uh, arranged to have a wonderful panel of some very interesting thinkers and thought leaders uh, that will be discussing the various aspects of the Trump-Pence regime and how it relates to uh, the history of this country, the history of the world, and uh, the rise of fascism uh, in this country and uh, historically uh, around the globe. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our moderator for this evening. Uh, Sansara Taylor is a writer for Revolution newspaper, Rev.com.us and has been, among other things, on the front lines of the fight for women's rights to abortion and all-around liberation for many years. She's also a co-initiator of RefusedFascism.org, and she'll be our moderator for tonight. Sansara. There we go. Good evening, and I want to thank Jay for the welcome, and I want to echo him in welcoming you here tonight, everybody in the church, everybody tuning in live on Facebook or online to tonight's teaching. Fascism in America. Could it happen here? Is it happening here? What is the danger the Trump-Pence government poses? As we approach the end of the first 100 days of the Trump-Pence government, some are calling it a failure. Some are finding assurance or reassurance in how little they claim he has accomplished. In reality, what is most striking is how much he has accomplished. A global gag order that will take the lives of thousands of women and put abortion beyond reach for millions more around the world. A witch hunt against scientists who worked on climate change and the acceleration of fossil fuel extraction that is destroying our planet. A new Supreme Court justice, or that's what they call him, who has defended torture, police brutality, and vicious religious bigotry. A proven racist as the head of the Justice Department. A Christian fundamentalist in charge of public schools. Not just one, but two Muslim bans where even after they were stopped by the courts, Trump found a way to impose them anyhow through diplomatic cables a ramped-up deportation force that has abducted a father in front of his daughter on the way to school, that snatched a cancer tumor patient out of the hospital, and that has deported the first DACA recipient and instilled terror into thousands, no millions of others throughout this country. And then there's his bellicose threats of war and military aggression, 59 Tomahawk missiles on Syria, the largest non-nuclear bomb in the world dropped on Afghanistan. And now he plays nuclear chicken with North Korea, literally playing with the lives of millions of people on this planet. To the degree that people see this as a failure to accomplish anything, to the degree that the media says he's finally becoming normal or more presidential, this is the degree to which the previously unthinkable has become normalized already, with even greater stakes for humanity if it is not stopped. This is why it is so important that we have gathered here together tonight. The world is changing rapidly, and it's important for us to take stock, to get an accurate picture of what we are facing, because you cannot stop something you do not understand. In the 1960s, when a generation stood up and helped stop a brutal war in Vietnam. Teach-ins were an essential part of that struggle, arming students and others with a deep understanding of the nature of the war they were confronting and the horrors it was causing. 
when the AIDS epidemic first emerged, a cohort of people, most of whom had no medical exp expertise at all, studied and became experts so that along with their courageous and disruptive activism, they had the knowledge they needed to fuel their fight to stop a plague. Today, fighting for this kind of knowledge is even more critical. A central part of the Trump-Pence government's program is an all-out assault on critical thinking, on the ability to discover what's true and to hold others to account for it. And so we must be even more determined tonight and going forward to fill ourselves with critical thinking and evidence, to foster deep thinking and understanding about the real world, and to confront fully and as deeply as possible the nature and the character of the danger we are facing in order to fuel our struggle and our fight in the name of humanity to stop the Trump-Pence regime. The questions we'll be getting into tonight are critical about fascism in America, and the speakers we have gathered will shed light on these questions from different political perspectives and with different areas of expertise, and so it'll be a rich exchange we will all be provoked, we will all learn new things, we will all be challenged, and we will all emerge with greater intellectual and moral tools and a heightened responsibility and ability to act on what we know. So I want to thank them and I want to thank all of you around the country tuning in and here in the church for spending your evening together with us doing this. I want to thank the United Methodist Church of the Village for opening this space to us. I want to thank all the volunteers who worked tirelessly to put this together. And I want to thank our partners for this evening, Revolution Books Educational Fund, they have a table in the back, and the WBAI radio station of the Pacifica Network, who is our media sponsor tonight. I also want to just say one thing about these cell phones, okay? Mainly I'm going to ask you to turn them off and shut them up and put them away and keep them from interrupting and distracting and disrupting our program. But before you do that, if you are on Facebook, I want you to take your cell phone out. If you're on Facebook, I'm going to give you a minute, take your cell phone out or if you're watching at home or in gatherings around the country, take your cell phone out, go to Facebook and go to refusefascism.org on Facebook. Look it up, it's refusefascism.org. When you find it, if you haven't yet, please like our page so we stay connected, and then scroll down just a little bit, and you'll see me on the camera talking to you on the Facebook page. Spread that link right now, share it. Tell your friends you're here watching, tell them to tune in. Right now, let's all take a moment together and gather more people expand our community, expand the understanding, and expand this journey tonight. So do that, please. As you do, I'm going to tell you the format for the evening. And when you're done, please make your phone be quiet. Turn it off. Stay focused. Join us, OK? So as you do that, I'm just going to explain our format, then we'll get started. We're going to have four speakers. They're going to speak somewhere between 15 and 20 minutes. They're going to share what they have to say. After they're done, we're going to have a very dynamic young woman come up and she's going to tell you a little bit about Refuse Fascism, what this movement is, who's sponsoring this event, and how you can get involved in doing something that's really going to make a difference in stopping the horrors we're learning about. After she does that, we are going to have our panelists come up. We're going to engage in a conversation. I will ask a question to, to launch that and get an exchange going. Then we will open it up to questions from the audience here in the room and questions from people watching online. And you can submit those questions. We have a phone number. I hope it shows up. You can text them to us if you're at home. And if you're in the audience, you can write them down on a um, uh, note card that we have passed around. Our ushers will collect them. And if that's complicated and you're on Facebook and you want to write a comment, your question in the comment area, we'll look there too. So that'll be our program. We aim to end at about 9.30. And with that, I want to get us started and dive into the evening. So our first speaker, I'm very happy to introduce, is a writer whose articles, poetry, and fiction have appeared in the New York Times, in Book Forum, in the Los Angeles Review of Books and other journals. He's the editor-at-large for Cabinet Magazine. 
and his latest book is Stefan Zweig, At the End of the World. He recently wrote an article for The New Yorker entitled, When It's Too Late to Stop Fascism. I'd like to ask you to join me in giving a warm welcome to George Prochnik. How's this for volume? Is that okay? Um, th thanks so much for having me to this event. Um, I'm going to try to give a little historical lens on the threat that we face. And to begin that, I want to read something not by Stefan Zweig, but from Primo Levi, who was an Italian chemist and eventually a survivor of Auschwitz. He wrote a very, uh, one of the greatest memoirs that exists about that experience. And he wrote the following. We must be listened to above and beyond our personal experiences. We have collectively witnessed a fundamental, unexpected event. Fundamental precisely because unexpected, not foreseen by anyone. It took place in the teeth of all forecasts. It happened that an entire civilized people followed a buffoon whose figure today inspires laughter. And yet Adolf Hitler was obeyed and his praises were sung right up to the catastrophe. It happened, therefore it can happen again. That is the core of what I have to tell you. I want to come back at some point. I hope someone will ask a question about that idea of the buffoon, because I actually think that's very important in terms of how Trump, is, Trump has been perceived, and to an extent, how he's been normalized. But Stefan Zweig, um, the man that I wrote about, was a person of enormous affluence and influence, an Austrian Jew who was born uh, at the end of the 19th century, and by the late 1920s, was the most widely translated author in the world. A huge bestseller. His films were made into movies. He wrote novels, essays, poetry, libretti, plays. He also grew up in a very wealthy family in Vienna's most privileged district, the first district on the Ringstrasse. This was a person who felt himself absolutely immune to histories, to political turbulence. And within a very short period of time, within, in fact, less than 10 years from the point at which he was the most widely translated author in the world, Stefan Zweig's books were being burned, and he himself was on the run from not just Hitler, but the overall resurgence of an intense militant nationalism that came about with the ascendancy of fascism. To give just a little background on his exile, because it's germane to the book that he wrote, the memoir that he wrote, that I want to focus on and what I have to say. In 1934, in the winter of 1934, there was a brief civil war in Austria. It's an event that not many people who don't study the period know much about. It took place over just a period of a few weeks, but it effectively gutted the Austrian, the very powerful and very effective Austrian Socialist Party. It was essentially a, a battle between the socialists and various reactionary forces allied with the then cleric-fascist leader of, of Austria, someone named Dolphus, who wasn't himself at that point aligned with Hitler, who was in fact trying to keep um, Austria from being annexed by Germany, but had his own homegrown version of fascism and felt sufficient pressure from the more reactionary elements in his party to, that, that, he, that he felt he could no longer allow socialism to exist as a viable movement in, in Austria. And once he managed to essentially destroy the party by either arresting people or driving them into various forms of exile and killing 
many hundreds, the road was open for, um, for Hitler, Hitler's annexation of the country in 1938. Stefan Zweig, when that civil war took place, was based in Salzburg, which is just over the border from Germany. He himself had been working for years at that point to promote humanism. He was one of the best known pacifists in the world. He had a home on a hill, in fact, overlooking Salzburg, a very exposed position. Nonetheless, at one point as the war was winding down, his home was searched by the local police for guns. They, there was a suspicion that he might be hiding arms for, to be distributed to the socialists. And he knew at that point that if one of the best known pacifists in the world could be accused of harboring a secret weapons cache at the same time that he also was in an incredibly exposed position, that he himself was going to be endangered in no short order. And the very next day, he got on a train and headed to England, which was the first stop in an exile that careened all over the world eventually. He was, he was in, first in London, then in Bath, England, then in New York, then in Ossinic, New York, then in Rio de Janeiro, and then at last in Petropolis, Brazil, just above Rio, about an hour above Rio in the hills, where he killed himself in February of 1942. But the summer before he killed himself, he was just up the Hudson from where those of us in New York City are today, not very far at all. He lived, in fact, about a mile uphill from Sing Sing Prison. And I've often thought what it would have been like for him going back and forth on the train from New York City and having the sight of that massive fortress as a reminder of what was happening to his, his people and to all of Europe at that point in time. While he was in Austria, excuse me, in Ossining, in that summer of 1942, he wrote at a furious pace the first draft of his autobiography, The World of Yesterday. But it's not a typical memoir. It has almost no intimate personal details of his life. Instead, what he was trying to do was to create a kind of message in the bottle to the future, to give indications about what aspects of civilization needed to be watched because they could pivot into something, some kind of heinous form of totalitarianism, and also to give some, some index, index of what might be points of hope, what, what were aspects of the evolution of Europe that he'd lived through, which if they'd been cultivated might have prevented Hitler's rise. He managed to write literally something like 300 pages in a matter of less than a month. He was writing in this feverish pace. He never left this very, very small, very grim bungalow that he lived in. And it's amazing to think of this man who had been at the center of all sorts of different European movements aimed at promoting humanism, redu it reduced to this very, very contracted existence, almost no social life in this tiny little house in this town that for him was in the middle of nowhere. But I think it gave him a certain fiery clarity, gave his remarks a real passion that it merits revisiting today, because he tried to trace what he had missed. It's a very, it's a very modest book in many ways. One of, the, one of the points that he makes right away is that he can't remember when he first heard Hitler's name. He doesn't know where that, the whole movement associated with Hitler and even preceding Hitler in terms of Italian fascism, where it began to be a real issue. One of the points Zweig makes is that in these periods where there is uh, an, an intense upsurge of nationalist reactionary elements, there are going to be many little figures, any one of whom might be the one who from some bizarre confluence of circumstances ends up being the dictator to watch. And I've thought about this for a number of reasons in terms of what we're seeing today, partly because horrific as this administration is, we don't know that Trump is the person who is going to really take things all the way over the edge. And I think it behooves all of us to be very vigilant about other figures who may seem absolutely marginal today, but who are garnering some kind of support in some little corner and may ultimately have, if not a charisma, some magnetic message, some way to channel a very dark will amongst, amongst the masses. 
So, what does Feig tell us to watch out for? One thing he says, and he, and he remarks on this long before Hitler, again, was the chancellor of Germany, but when fascism was gaining power, he, he writes of seeing the little groups of young conscripts to the National Socialist Movement moving through town in these beautiful limousines, in very, very fancy cars, trucks, and spanky new uniforms, very, 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 very well decked out. In other words, they were well financed. And I think it's always good in, a, you know, in the old Marxist adage to follow the money. And so one thing with this administration, and it's more, more I don't know what the right word is, more virulently activist elements, is to look at what is being funded. He says the second thing to watch out for and maybe the most important aspect of what we witnessed in this last election is the power of propaganda, right? Um, and it's not just propaganda to spread a lie, to ins ignite a frenzy among the core followers. It's also propaganda that can serve to distract and cover up the actions, where, that, the actions that the administration, that the party is focused on really managing to bring through to fruition. I thought a lot about this issue of distraction in this last campaign, even apart from the message of hate. I think if the planet survives another 100 years, survives this man and his, and his like-minded cohort, I suspect that people will look back on the 2016 election as a real watershed in the distraction of the electorate, partly technologically induced ADD. I mean, there, there can't have been any campaign before where there could be one outrage after another, which would just seem to evaporate within days, partly because the mainstream media didn't continue covering it, but also because people seemed unable to hold in their heads the jumble of the sheer volume of outrages, but also the sheer volume and barrage of different kinds of information that were being fed through them, through this feed that we seem all too addicted to. There, there, there was a remark that really rang through my head from Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis, who noted that when the Constitution was being framed in Independence Hall, the authors of that document had the road in front of, of Independence Hall covered with straw so that the sound of the coach wheels would be muffled and wouldn't disturb their, dis their debates, their discussions. And if, I, if we think about that level of attention and the absolute diffraction of our minds today, I think we all have to do everything we can to spend time off all devices and really trying to think as hard as we can to just think about what's going on in the most, in the most concentrated way possible. Um, along with propaganda, the money, and the charismatic leader that in some sense we have to acknowledge Trump is, Zweig makes the point that the Nazi party was able to introduce its measures as effectively as it did because it took the approach of giving one poison pill at a time. It didn't try, the party didn't try, in other words, to throw everything on at once and just disorient people. There was an effort to see how each new measure would take and when the European body politic gave sufficient resistance to a measure, they'd back off and wait, and then give another pill. It was one pill at a time until Zweig writes, people were so inured to the effects of the poison that they were willing essentially to embrace the, the, the apocalypse. Finally, on this issue of Trump's character and, and the idea which I think resonates very profoundly with what we've seen of the buffoon I can't tell you how many writers, activists, thinkers of the 1930s wrote about their experience of Hitler initially having been an experience of such a fool that they could not believe that this man should be taken seriously. 
Um, the son of Thomas Mann, Klaus Mann, who was himself an important writer and progressive thinker, described an experience where he was sitting in a, in a Bavarian tea house at one point, and he realized Hitler was at another table with a few of his henchmen. And he was there consuming these little cakes in this unbelievably boorish manner, stuffing his face. And Mann says that he looked at this man, at this petite bourgeoisie figure, this embodiment of just a kind of vile piggishness, and said, there's nothing to worry about. He can't possibly cause us a problem. Zweig writes about how when Hitler's writings were, began to be circulated, the, how the, his sheer inarticulateness, his inability to make an effective argument, to, to say anything with force, made the intellectuals just dismiss him in exactly the same way. I worry that all of the ways that Trump has shown himself willing to play the fool, to, to be a clown, to show, to display his intellectual mediocrity, has allowed sometimes for a, a kind of snarkiness to overtake a real analysis of what he's doing of all of the little measures on top of the big threats that he makes. I think it's been, what, however intentionally or not, it doesn't matter, it's been an incredibly effective smokescreen. Everyone has so much to mock that the fact that he does exactly what he says he does, that he has to be taken both seriously and literally, gets lost. In Zweig's memoir, he goes through a whole slew of different stages that darkened the canvas in Europe. And he says, finally, that one thing was still missing. This was after Hitler's ascendancy. He said, even when Hitler became chancellor, people still, and he counts himself among the people, had no notion, no notion whatsoever of what was coming. Not a clue. For all that they were aware that they had Put in, that Germany had put in power an incredibly dangerous, unpredictable person with incredibly vicious rhetoric, there was not a hint of what was to come. So what was the moment for Zweig that really tipped events into some irretrievable, disastrous abyss? That was uh, the Reichstag fire, the burning of the German parliament building. It happened less than 30 days after Hitler became chancellor. This was a fire that there's been speculation may have even been ignited by Nazis, the Nazis themselves. No lives were lost. It was the destruction of a symbolic edifice. But it became the excuse for Hitler to suspend all pretense of due legal process. Everything from that point on became an emergency measure. Of course, it seems to me that we already see signs of Trump looking for that act of terror, either false or actual, exaggerated or not, that gives him the excuse to suspend any kind of judicial responsibility. I worry profoundly about that. And it's one of the reasons that I think so far from ever allowing this administration to be normalized, it has to be resisted every single step in every single executive order has to be protested. There, the minute that an agenda that we know has such an enormous tide of hatred behind it is in any way allowed to become business as usual. I think that the opportunity for bursting out with some massive atrocity that changes the, the ball game overnight is huge. You know, people are still making a lot of money in this administration, while this administration's in power. That's one of the reasons that the GOP has shown itself so spineless. 
until the economics are disrupted, I think it's going to be very, very hard to really get at him. But if people boycott goods, if they block roads, if, if, if the people who make Trump possible start feeling this is not working out so well economically, maybe we can avoid that, that catastrophic last moment. You know, Zweig teaches us that there is, in fact, a, a window in which it's possible to act. But once that comes down, you're in a whole other reality, and there's no way out. And I hope that all of us do everything in our power to seize this hour now. We do still have the power to act. Things aren't yet set in stone. And it's all of our responsibility to do everything we can to fight. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you, George, um, and I want to, I really appreciate your comments. I want to remind people, if you're in the audience and you got a note card, be taking notes, be writing down questions. If you are in the viewing live audience, text us at the number you see up here on the podium. I will also read it to you. It's 917-407-1286. And I will remind you, because I think it's a both because he said it, and I think it's a good question. He was saying, I hope somebody's going to ask about this buffoonery and the, mo the mockery and the making light of Trump rather than what's beneath all there is to mock and the danger of that. So that was one of the things. And anything else you're provoked by, please be sending in the questions. Um, next, we want to bring up our next speaker is the director of Casa Freehold in New Jersey. Now, Casa Freehold works with new immigrants arriving to the U.S. Casa Freehold is part of, and the person you're about to hear from, in the past was on the executive board of the National Day Laborers Organizing Network, which fights for civil, labor, and human rights of day laborers. And with the Trump administration's all-out assault on immigrants and threats to sanctuary cities, she is on the front lines. Now, before I bring her up, I just want to ask our live streamers, the mics are OK? Are we in good shape? Yeah? OK, good. I just want to do that before we bring you up. Um, so please join me in, in welcoming to the stage Rita Dentino of Casa Freehold. Thank you. This one. This one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm really honored to be invited here to be with you tonight, both you who are here and you who are across the country. Um, I always feel, um, well, myself, I am the most at home at maybe six o'clock in the morning out on the street with the day laborers. Um, Sometimes when I, people see me there on a Sunday morning, here we are in a church, um, and they see me outdoors along the side of the street, um, some church people will assume that I am there as a representative of a church, which I am actually not. And uh, I say, I am also one of the workers, just the same as the people I'm with. We're just all equal here. So, um, and Sunday for us is pretty much the same as every other day. We don't have things called weekends and things like that. Um, we don't go out on Friday night knowing that we could sleep in on Saturday morning. That whole world does not exist with us or with any day labor. But right now, um, I would like to back up and say a piece of news that I heard just today. I had heard it, but I hadn't read it as fully, really, until actually I got here. Um, and, and it brings out, you know, some of what you were just talking about. And a program was announced today, I believe, and this program 
It's called VOICE. <laughs> Strange name, actually. And VOICE is an acronym that stands for Victims of Immigration Crime Engagement. So V-I-C-E, V-O-I-C-E, like that. Um, and that's supposed to be a national hotline for victims of crimes, you know, that have been done against them by immigrants and refugees. Um, it's, it's part, really, of this whole thing that's been especially uh, strong under Trump, but it's really been going on for quite a while, um, of criminalizing immigrants and criminalizing refugees. Um, the mistake they made this time, and they made a really big mistake to me, and when I read more deeply into it, is they published a list of all the people in Homeland Security who are undocumented immigrants. And who they published in that list were little tiny babies. They didn't take any age difference. So a newborn baby could be the criminal who committed the crime and made you a victim. <laughs> and I looked at that and I said, what? You know, how far have they gone this time? You know, that they could have done that. You know, I have been doing this work for the last 14 years and, and I work with unaccompanied minors, children who cross the border by themselves and hopefully make their way to some protected place to stay eventually. Um, and in all that time, till today, their identity was kept private. Anybody under 18, their identity was kept private. We, you know, even those people who are trying to help them, you know, that could be a blockade a little bit, but that's okay because we understood we were protecting children. But as of today, the identity of babies and children has all been put out into the light. And, and that's how, how little this Trump administration cares about, about these people. You know, and it also shows though how much in the front lines of this whole thing immigrants are, and especially, well, day laborers, I think most of all, I think day laborers, and I also think domestic workers. Day laborers are visible. We see them out on the corner waiting for work. Domestic workers are more invisible. They're in homes. They're caring for that which we love the most, our families, our homes, um, and they're often, you know, under the worst of conditions. Um, so and we, well, we need to remember them too, and sometimes in our situation as advocates, we have to go and rescue them. Um, should I move this down just a little, or? I don't know. <laughs> it looks like it's like keep, up keep, over keep my nose. <laughs> okay, um, okay. But um, anyway, I just, that um, hit me with as such a slap, and we talk about these, these these crossing times, and, and you described it very, very, you know, um, sadly, but beautifully, you know, these, these crossing times when we come to a realization, and, and this today, when they come out with this voice program, was, for me, a crossing time. Um, but really, what Trump inherited, Trump inherited a ready-made, horrible, broken, immigration system. So he didn't really have to create something. He created, I mean, he inherited a prison industrial complex, which many of you here are familiar with and have been fighting for some time and know that we have um, only 5% of the world's population here and 25% in prisons. And Immigrants are part of those in that prison industrial complex, and they are people of color. And, and that's, that's a point, too, that's so important in this, um, in this whole Trump regime um, thing, is, is people of color. Because, you know, I, I've also been, been reading more and more that with 
his order of hierarchies, and in here comes also this, this kind of comparison of, um, of what is the purest race, or whatever you want to call it, um, that picking out those chosen people, and, and we've seen, you know, the, um, the white male is the highest of the hierarchy. The woman is not so high, <laughs> um, and many there's many people talking now about the handmaiden's tale, and certainly um, people of color. And when it comes to the immigrant hierarchy, many are saying that it's really going to be the immigrants of color who are going to take the harvest hit, and they always have, um, but now they will more than others. So. Those day laborers that I stand on the corner with so early in the morning in my very favorite place, um, they're out there and they're so vulnerable now. Um, you know, sometimes I think to myself, if somebody took me up and they plopped me up and they stuck me on a corner in China and I didn't speak the language and I didn't know the culture and I had a full expectation that some stranger was gonna come along, pick me up, take me to work, and pay me and treat me respectfully, and at the end of the day, they were gonna bring me back. I think, I must be crazy to have such an expectation, but that's really the expectation that day laborers live with every single day. So the people who see day laborers, they look maybe comfortable hanging out. <laughs> They're really not so comfortable hanging out, you know, and, and they have to worry about ice showing up, um, and they have to worry how those bosses, whoever the boss happens to be who's going to come that day, how they're gonna treat them. Um, and now under this Trump regime, uh, sadly, Trump has empowered the worst of the worst in our country. And so we have um, instances of not long ago in the middle of the snow and the wind and the cold, I received a call from workers, 12 workers had gone out and just been left in the middle of nowhere. They had no idea where they were. Um, and, and this very hard man, he just left them there. And, and we, and then we had to find them and go and get them back. And, and we have more of these kind of things. And luckily no harm had come to them. And luckily too, another, a good Samaritan came in the meantime and brought them into a warm place. Um, but we're gonna have more of these kind of things. And as far as, you know, I echo what my friend was saying that we have to act daily. You know, I hear people say, oh, the next election. No, it's not the next election. <laughs> it might not be any election. You know, I worked at the election, actually, and I woke up and I had maybe like five minutes or so to get upset, and then it was time to get back to work. But, and it's a work daily as every single person, they, you know, people have for too long been in their comfort zones, whichever they are. We all like to be around the cup people who have similar beliefs to us. We're marching down the same path. But I think we have to make a pledge to ourselves now, every single day, to step out of that normal comfort zone and begin to do that on an individual level. And then, yes, join with people, like-minded people like we're with right now, hopefully, but also, go outside on the street and somebody who we would never talk with or never be with, do that every single day, you know? And we have to make our world bigger because um, otherwise it will be made very small for us. <laughs> and I'd like to Okay, thank you, Rita. 
I want to read the number again for people to text in your questions. It's 917-407-1286. I'll say that again, it's 917-407-1286. And if you have a question and a note card in the audience already, hold it up and the ushers will come grab it for you and we'll make sure that we have them ready to go. I see somebody, so somebody should come and take that. I'm promising you'll come take it, so thank you very much. Um, okay, so we're going to keep moving. We have two more speakers we want to hear from. And next, we have the pleasure of hearing from the executive director and a founder of the Center for Biological Diversity, one of the leading environmental organizations in this country. This person writes and lectures on the threats to and preservation of and relationships between cultural and biological diversity. After the 2016 election, he and the Center for Biological Diversity launched a country countrywide tour, which I love the title of, called Earth to Trump Roadshow of Resistance. So let's show some love for Kieran Suckler. Come on up. Well, hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Great. Well, I'm the uh, executive director of an environmental group, and uh, as I'm sure everyone knows here, Trump is a disaster for, for the environment. Um, just in the last few days, for example, he, uh, he issued an executive order to initiate a process to, to strip protection from a billion acres of land and water that were put in place by past presidents going back to Clinton. He has uh, revoked rules that formally made it illegal to dump coal mining waste into streams. He has approved uh, the most dangerous pesticide in use today, one that is known to um, give brain damage to children. And I could go on and on. Um, but what I'm mostly going to talk about tonight, though, is not environmental issues per se, um, but going more toward the authoritarian tendency, toward the fascist tendency with which he puts these in place. Um, because obviously, he's not the first president to harm the environment. Um, and my group certainly sued the Obama administration many times over policies that we didn't like, just as we sued the, the Bush administration. With that, I will note, we have sued Trump every single week of his presidency so far. <laughs> And, and we will continue to do so, which by my calculation means we need to sue him about another 50 times or so. Um, but I want to talk about that authoritarian tendency because while we were forced to sue the Obama administration on many, many times on environmental issues, when the court order came down saying Obama, this is wrong, you can't do that. The Obama administration would accept that order as the law of the land. He had a bad policy, but he did not have an authoritarian policy. And so he would accept that order, whereas I think what's extraordinarily dangerous about Trump is his refusal to acknowledge the courts. So, stepping back a bit to the, t to the question here, you know, uh, fascism, can it happen here? Is it happening here? Yeah, I think it is happening here. Um, I think it can be stopped. I think it will be stopped because there's been an extraordinary resistance uh, rising up uh, with Trump. You know, people seeing this like I've never 
never seen before in my years of doing this work. I think we will be stopping only because of that resistance, which is going to have to keep growing uh, and being getting stronger and more insistent every day. But we're seeing a, a lot of signs, a lot of warning signs, and so I want to talk about um, some of those. Uh, some I'll just list, and some I'll talk a little bit in more detail. And one is nationalism. If we look back, uh, or even just sideways at current fascist regimes, one of the things you see very consistently is this fascist, I'm sorry, this nationalist tendency. Doesn't mean all nationalists are fascists, but that is a common denominator to them all. With that nationalism, you see a racism and a marginalization of others consistently uh, across the board. Because in part, I think fascists need enemies to fight at all times. Um, and that brings up another more psychological characteristic, which is this intense sense of victimization. And, and you see this with Trump you know, throughout his whole history before he even got to, um, into politics, this constant sense that he, you know, one of the most richest men in the country, now the president of the most powerful country on earth, is the victim. And you see that constantly with him. So that's one of the reasons I like to call him Trump of thin skin. And that is also a characterization you see it with many, many other fascist authoritarian leaders. Um, and not just personally, because they're speaking to their base, telling them that they are also the victims. They're the victims of the outsider. They, these people, who typically are the people with the least power possible, somehow they are threatening you, right? Somehow your life is existentially threatened by gay people. You are threatened by Jews. You're threatened by immigrants, the least powerful people in our entire nation. So this constant sense of victimhood and fear and violence. Um, and with that, I think, another thing you see is this constant uh, sense of self-anger, aggrandizement uh, with Trump and again with other authoritarian leaders, this need to constantly promote themselves of how great they are. Those just perfectly with this sense of victimhood. There's a convergence with industry, in the interest of industry. And this is a complicated one because it's not just um, industry overall, but picking and choosing uh, industries and getting them on board with threats. And you see this with, with Trump. And industries now have, have learned early on, if you get on board with his agenda, he's going to promote you. If you don't, he's going to attack you and your stocks are going to decline. And so there's a real convergence of interest between authoritarian and industry that develops. There is an endorsement of violence. Endorsement of violence in all aspects of life. And so Trump himself, right, as a sexual predator, and someone through his public actions right, has promoted that as acceptable at that level in his uh, um, election events running uh, for president, encouraging people to violently attack people in the audience opposing him, uh, inviting people to come and be violent at the inauguration to launching the Tomahawk missiles. This notion that um, violence is acceptable, normal in all facets of existence um, is a very deep authoritarian fascist tendency. And then the, the blatant lying. 
that you see is also something we see across. And this is a very complex um, psychological thing, which I'm not even going to try to unravel it entirely. Um, but I'll say one thing about it. It's an exercise in power, right? To get up and say things that are just absolutely untrue in public and then to keep insisting on them. One of the things that is is an exercise in power. It's saying, I don't care what anyone else thinks. I don't care what the critics say. I have the power to stay with this and to stick with this. And I'm going to show you that by doing something so outrageous. And so, you know, he, he will actually claim, right, I have the, the biggest electoral margin victory in history over Clinton. Just you know, any six year olds can go on the internet and show that's not true. Um, but it's not that Trump exactly is wrong on this, it's that this is a demonstration of raw power. And, you, and so telling him he's wrong doesn't take away from that. In some ways, it feeds that machine. There's something really, I think, profound that all of us as resistors and media have to think about, which is that there is a way in which fact-checking him feeds that system, which is not to say you can't do it, but we have to think of how to do it, how to do it differently, or maybe more importantly, how to combine it with something else other than fact-checking. Um, and then finally, and most obviously, I suppose, is this concentration of absolute power in the executive, which is Trump, which uh, is the very definition of fascism. And I want to talk about that more, and, and specifically this. It seems to me, if you're going to succeed in being a fascist, you know, if you read the fascist manual, one of the things you'll realize is quickly is you have to go to war with the media. You cannot be a fascist if you do not, because the media will expose you. It will object. And you cannot be a fascist unless you deal with that, unless you go to war. And of course, we've seen that with Trump for a long, long time now. Um, I'm not going to go into detail because it's, uh, that's just, it's so obvious, but I'm sure you all remember him at one point even calling the media um, the enemy of the people. The sort of classic move. If you attack me, you attack the people. If you attack me, you attack the nation. You know, I am not only the authority, I essentially am the symbol uh, of society, of the nation. Um, and so we've seen that and we'll keep seeing this. And by the way, not just in his verbal statements, of course, but you know, the media were attacked physically during uh, his uh, um, election. You may remember the, uh, I forget what they call them now, but the little areas where the, the media were forced to sit in during his his rallies, an extraordinary exercise of power over them, and, and, and also extraordinary weakness, frankly, of the reporters to go in them. Now, if you went outside them, you would be arrested, as some of them were. But so what? I mean, that's your job at that point, is to get arrested, to refuse that power, to take that hit. Because you know what? You're a member of the media, which means yeah, you're probably white and middle class. You're going to survive. They'll put you in jail. They'll take you out. Right? Not that hard to do. And it's your job to put yourself on the line at that moment. And we saw the media fail consistently at that moment. You've got to go to war with science if you're a fascist. Because if you have absolute authority, you get to say what's true. And that doesn't work very well if you've got a bunch 
no scientists running around collecting data and telling you other things that are true. Uh, and this is false. And we've seen with Trump this is an extraordinary war on science. Not just in his denial of things we know are true, um, denying global warming and so forth, you know, putting people in charge of these agencies um, who wants to think that, but literally removing thousands of web pages from government websites that are there to present the science that has been collected about human health, environmental health, history, everything. I mean, he's just scrubbing the availability of all the scientific information that our agencies have been collecting for decades because he doesn't want it out there. He, in one of his uh, orders, told of the federal agencies they no longer have to present data, for example, on animal welfare. Right now, there's sort of various laws, zoos, other people have to present their reports every year. Um, just take those away, take all that data away. Um, and, so, and that's why we had, just recently, this march on science, which was a march for science, rather, uh, across the country, which, you know, in my 30 years of doing environmental activism, I've never seen scientists go and rally in the streets as scientists. Um, it was true. On the one hand, you know, chilling that they needed to do that, that it's come to that. Um, but on the other hand, really remarkable that, that they did do it. And not just here, all over the world. Scientists were marching in London against Trump. Um, an extraordinary spread of resistance. Um, you, and this is probably the most important one, you have to go to war with the court system. No fascist country in the history of the earth has had a functioning court system. They're utterly incompatible. Because a fascist, by definition, is the law, and so cannot be held accountable to another law. And that's what the court system is all about. I want to. Uh, Go in a little more detail on this um, and read some things. First of all, actually, maybe I'll give a slight little bit of background. I started the Center for Electrical Diversity when I was in, um, going to graduate school at SUNY Stony Brook. And I, I was studying philosophy at that time. And I wasn't particularly interested in the law, I, I think. She was probably similar to, to many folks, which is, well, sort of a, probably a necessary evil, more or less, you know, if people were just good, we wouldn't need this court system and so far, um, you know, and I viewed it as a fairly um, uh, uh, overly rule-bound world. And then I got into environmentalism, and I quickly learned just how incredibly important the law is to justice and to social movements, how incredibly important it was to the civil rights movement. And, you know, the way our government is structured, we've basically got three pillars. We've got Congress, which independently creates the law, can create whatever law that it wishes. It can't be made to do so by the president, for example can't be made to do so by the courts. It has the absolute power in that realm of making laws. Then you've got the presidency, the executive. And the executive needs to carry out the laws of the Congress, whether the executive likes them or not, uh, but also has uh, independent power. And then finally, you've got the courts. And one of the most important thing the courts do 
is to judge whether the presidency, meaning the whole executive system through the agencies, whether they are violating the law or not. And they can also judge Congress to say, did a law that you created, is that in contradiction with the Constitution? Because that is the one limit to congressional laws. Congress cannot violate the Constitution, and the courts are the one realm that can decide that. And it's an incredibly important system, and in fact, there's a, you know, there are groups of uh, lawyers internationally all over the world who their whole work is to go into nations which are sort of developing democracies and try to help them build a functioning legal system because they will never succeed in becoming a fully functional democracy unless they've got uh, a working system. Uh, you can't have justice finally without a functioning legal system. And so I I've grown to see how just incredibly important it is, um, and I think we're seeing that today more than ever uh, with Trump's response to the law. So, he was sued twice over executive orders on immigration, and twice those orders were struck down as illegal. And as I mentioned before, every president has various rules and laws, or various rules they put in place struck down. Every Congress has some laws that is created also struck down as unconstitutional. But for the most part, they accept that. Whether they wanted it or not, whether they agree with it or not, they accept it as something they must comply with because the judiciary under our system is a distinct and independent entity. So when Trump lost the first trial over immigration. Uh, this is one brought by the city of Seattle and others. One of his spokesmen, Stephen Miller, went on TV to talk about it. And here's his description um, of what happened there, uh, his response to that. He said, our opponents, comma, the media, and the whole world. So it begins right there with the attack the media. Our opponents, the media, the whole world will soon see as we begin further actions that the powers of the president to protect our country are very substantial and will not be questioned. Which is what the court just did. He said, I want to say something very clearly, and this is going to be very disappointing to the people protesting the president. And I'll point out in my next one, the other thing you have to go to war with to be a fascist is civil dissent. And that comes in right here as well. I want to say something very clearly, and this is going to be very disappointing to the people protesting the president. The president's powers here are beyond question. Okay. This is our president speaking. The bottom line is the president's power in this area represent the apex of executive authority. And then kind of really just cutting to the chase, he says, the judiciary is not supreme. There's no such thing as judicial supremacy. Well, we call it the fucking Supreme Court for a reason, okay? It is supreme. The court system, and especially the Supreme Court, can overturn any policy of the president if it's illegal, can overturn any law if it finds it to be illegal. That's why we call it the Supreme Court. And I myself, in my group, have filed many lawsuits, and I've lost a fair amount of them. 
I'm not happy about it. And when I lost them, some old growth trees got cut down. Some rivers got polluted because I lost that pace. But I have to accept that we lost that in the court. Because if you don't, that's when you get chaos. Because if the court can't answer that finally, there's no other option, right, but guns. And once you go there, it's violence and chaos. And so we all have to accept that. And this is most grating for Trump and for every fascist around the world, right? Every fascist, as they rose to power, was challenged by the courts. And the court said, you're wrong, you can't do that, you don't have that power. And they are very bulwark against it, and so every fascist has gone to war with the courts. And that's what we have seen here. In fact, the court order that Trump was railing against there um, in this first case, uh, I, I want to read uh, just a, a brief part from it. But first I'll sort of point this out. The issue before the court was whether there could be a court case at all. Because the Trump administration's defense of its immigration order was this policy is not reviewable by the court system. You cannot judge me at all. I don't have to prove I'm correct because you have no right to judge me at all. This needs to be bounced out of court. Um, so his very legal argument was against the very power of the court. And this is why the court in its response wrote, there's no precedent, precedent to support this claim of unreviewability. It runs contrary to the fundamental structure of our constitutional democracy. And that right there is what set Trump off to attack the court system and declare that he has supreme powers. Um, and so we're seeing this war with the courts. It should be a sign to us that we'll go on. I'm going to cut it short here because we're, I'm sure we're going to have time to, uh, to talk uh, in the question and answer session, but just listing the last point I wanted to make, you've got to go to war with civil protest. You've got to declare violence against it. Ultimately, you have to make it illegal, and we're seeing this happen at the state level. So with that, I will pass it on to the next speaker. Okay, so I'm really glad you returned to the Steve Miller quote. I think that was one of many things, but a very important thing that didn't get covered as everybody's talking about all the buffoonery. So hopefully we'll get back to that in the discussion. I want to read once again for everybody watching the number to text your question. You can also do it if you'd rather text it in the audience. It's 917-407-1286. That's 917-407-1286. Um, and anybody who's collected uh, questions already, if you could bring them up to me in the front so I'm ready with them when we get to the question and answer. We are going to now move to our last presentation. And we are going to hear from the spokesperson for Revolution Books, which is the intellectual and cultural center of a movement for an actual revolution right here in this country. At the heart of Revolution Books is the new communism that has been developed and forged by Bob Avakian, the chairman of the Revolutionary Communist Party. And this bookstore features a wide range of books on philosophy, science, novels, poetry, the arts, history, and more from all around the world. And our next speaker, in addition to being the spokesperson for Revolution Books, is also a co-initiator of this movement, together with others, of refused fascism. Join me in welcoming Andy Z.
All right, how you doing? Okay. Sound good? Yeah. All right. Fascism in America. Could it happen here? Yes. Is it happening here? Yes. The call to action of refuse fascism begins the Trump-Pence regime is a fascist regime. Not insult or exaggeration. This is what it is. What is the danger that the Trump-Pence government poses? Nothing less than the fate of the planet and humanity as we know it. This regime has already taken measures which, if allowed to continue much longer, will have devastating effects on the environment. Deadly impact that could take decades to undo if, and that is a big if, repair would even be possible. And should the regime be able to carry out their full plan, the result would be catastrophic. This is not the worst of it. Even, at its, even as it is ethically suspect to quantify just which of the many horrific measures that this regime is taking is actually worse. Nevertheless, the call to action from refused fascism says, quote, because Trump has his finger on the nuclear trigger, the Trump-Pence regime is more dangerous to the world than Hitler. We must be clear. The Trump-Pence regime has already brought the world closer to nuclear war than any time in the last 80 years, according to those who set, who set what is called the doomsday clock. They say it is now two and a half minutes to midnight. The first hundred days of this fascist regime in the Trump-Pence administration have tripled the number of civilian casualties in the Middle East. Trump launched missiles at Syria while dining at his Florida country club. And the next week, he dropped the biggest non-nuclear bomb made for no other purpose than intimidating the entire world. Now, he is engaged in the most dangerous and thoroughly unjust nuclear blackmail with North Korea. Trump boasted that he would bomb the shit out of them and he said, if we have nuclear weapons, why can't we just use them? And then there's Vice President Pence, standing on the North Korean border, declaring, we're going to abandon the failed policy of strategic patience. These deadly actions are, on the one hand, a continuation of aggressive and murderous policies carried out by Obama and previous administrations but they are now supercharged with the strongman imperative of a fascist regime which has riled up its social base to support and to demand that the gloves, such as they were, come off in order to bludgeon the entire world to their vision of making America first. This must be stopped. And to do so will require the most determined struggle all of you here tonight and those of you watching on live stream, now is the time to stand together, organizing thousands and ultimately millions to, to as Refuse Fascism says in its call, to move heaven and earth to drive out this regime. And that this must be a moment in history when millions stand together with conviction and courage, overcoming fear and uncertainty, to resist and say no not just for ourselves, but in the name of humanity. So as Sansara said, I'm Andy Z. I'm one of the initiators of Refuse Fascism and the spokesperson for Revolution Books. I'm also an advocate for the new communism developed by the revolutionary leader, Bob Avakian. But before I begin, I want to thank the other speakers for coming out tonight, for sharing your work and your insights. And I want to thank all of you for coming out and being a part of this program. Let tonight spark 10,000 conversations. 
And let tonight have those conversations be the basis upon which you go out and talk to many other people to act according to what you learned tonight. If you got a diagnosis of cancer, I hope you would do everything possible to drive it from your body. Radiation, chemo, changing your whole life so as to live. Does fascism, a societal cancer, require less? We face an emergency, and we face it now. Again, from Refuse Fascism's call, quote, fascism has direction and momentum. Dissent is piece by piece criminalized. The truth is bludgeoned. Group after group is demonized and targeted along a trajectory that leads to real horrors. Hasn't this already begun? Instilling fear and impacting and destroying lives, immigrant lives, Muslim lives, refugee lives, Mexican and Latino lives, black lives, and in a very real sense, ultimately the lives of people here and around the world. 48-year-old Romero Romulo Alvilca Gonzalez lived in the U.S. for decades. He dropped his teenage daughters off at school. Ice waited, then they pounced. Romulo is ripped away from his families. There are hundreds more stories. The Trump-Pence Attorney General Jeff Sessions, standing on the border with Mexico, a hellscape, he called it. He drawled with his sickening plantation master sneer. He said that this is, quote, a new era to rid American cities in the border of the filth brought on by the drug cartels and criminal organizations, employing Nazi language of demonization to terrorize immigrants and refugees and to mobilize a fascist base. And be clear, the word filth has real meaning to fascists. And this, after Jeff Sessions moved to rip up the consent decrees with racist, brutal police forces around the country, calling for the police to be, he was calling then for the police to be unhampered in terrorizing blacks and Latinos in the inner cities. And John Kelly, General John Kelly, head of Homeland Security, is rapidly moving to completely militarize the border, expanding and, and unleashing ice squads around the country, declaring that any and everyone in the U.S. illegally is subject to deportation. This is terror, and this we must stop. Look, deportation is not new. President Obama set a record deporting three million human beings. And let's get one thing straight. No human being is illegal, okay? <laughs> but the Trump-Pence fascist regime is not just continuing mass deportations on an enhanced steroid program, but their very arbitrariness combined with saying and meaning that every and all immigrants are suspect while ramping up the militarized repressive ICE apparatus and at the same time fighting to lock down U.S. borders with the wall and the travel ban is the road to a different society. It is a fascist zeitgeist and it will be a fascist law with horrific consequence. The demonization of the refugee and the immigrant, filth, criminals, rapists, stealing our jobs, Muslims, by definition terrorists, all this is the cutting edge of a whole fascist package of Make America White. Unfolding this piece by piece, acculturating people to accept this and turn their eyes away from those groups targeted and even more ominously, to prepare the country for even greater atrocities to rain down in bombs and war against the people from Africa, where the administration has loosened the rules of military engagement to the Mideast. This is fascism. 
And if we had the time, we could make the case for the same kind of transformations and vicious programs that are aimed against women, black people, LBGTQ persons, and the existential danger that this regime poses for the planet and all of its species. If you are concerned about, if you are fighting back on any of these fronts, understand that these battles are now living in a more, are not now living in a more favorable time because the people are aroused against Trump, but that these fights need to be waged as a whole with a unifying theme of driving out this regime. Because as fascism consolidates, there will be less and less ground to fight on, and it can become too late. As we approach the 100th day of this regime, the question is not, as the mainstream liberal media and the Democrats present it, how little Trump has accomplished in his 100 days. The essence of it is the matter is how much, how far, how draconian are the things he's already done and where this will lead if not stopped, and stopped soon. Everyone who sees the scale and the scope of what this regime has done and are doing must hammer at this everywhere you go. The Trump-Pence regime is doing that. Every day they jump from one outrage in word and deed to another, from dropping bombs to terrorizing communities while careening from one lying and threatening tweet and outrageous press conference to another. It's dizzying, and that is an integral part of the method to their madness. Through the sheer, unrelenting, outrageous horrors, people are becoming inert, and the madness gets normalized. From the refused fascism call to action, the Trump-Pence regime from day one has been, quote, subverting the separation of powers, the separation of church and state. The regime has called for a new nuclear arms race. It has demonized the press. It has dismissed the very concept of truth, substituting their own fabricated alternative facts. And most important, fascism is not just a gross combination of horrific reactionary policies. It is a qualitative change in how society is governed. So what is the essence of this qualitative change? And here I quote from the website revcom.us, the website of the Revolutionary Communist Party. The quote is this, quote, fascism is the exercise of blatant dictatorship by the capitalist imperialist ruling class, ruling through reliance on open terror and violence, trampling on what are supposed to be civil and legal rights, wielding the power of the state and mobilizing organized groups of fanatical thugs to commit atrocities against masses of people, particularly groups of people identified as enemies, undesirables, or dangers to society. At the same time, and this can be seen in studying the examples of Nazi Germany and Italy under Mussolini, that while it will likely move quickly to enforce certain repressive measures in consolidating its rule, a fascist regime is also likely to implement its program overall through a series of stages and even attempt at different points to reassure the people or certain groups among the people that they will escape the horrors if they quietly go along and do not protest or resist while others are being terrorized and targeted for repression, deportation, conversion, prison, or execution." End quote. Isn't this what is unfolding before our eyes? Trump and Pence, Sessions and Kelly, they've advocated for and begun the remaking of the police apparatus and, yes, the law. Be forewarned, said Jeff Sessions, this is a new era. This is the Trump era. Millions of black youth have been the targets of a slow genocide through mass incarceration. And before being locked up, they are confined in cities under intense police pressure with no way to survive but to fight each other over petty turf. And now comes the Trump-Pence regime to take the gloves off, including the threat to send in the feds 
to Chicago. Trump has unleashed rabid fascist racist thugs who have been organizing to do bloody street battle, now focused in Berkeley. And know this, there is no contradiction between fascism coming to power through elections and the mobilizing of a militia outside the direct control of the state. Again, the essence of fascism as a form of rule of a capitalist society is blatant dictatorship. That when it is fully imposed will mean the virtual elimination of basic democratic rights, including the right to dissent, and such change is most definitely now afoot. To be, cl to be clear, democratic rights have always been severely limited and curtailed for whole sections of the people, starting with the foundation of this country, in the genocide of the native peoples and in slavery, and the continuing legacy of brutality since, and increasingly so in recent years with 2.3 million incarcerated and 3 million people deported by Obama. And there has always been vicious repression and suppression against anyone who mounts a serious challenge to the system and who has a grounding among the masses. But fascism, what the Trump-Pence regime are preparing to bring down on society, is on a whole other level. So how did we get here? Trump's election surprised many, maybe even him. But the reality is that the fascist movements that he has cohered within and back and who are backing him and, and have been unleashed by his regime have been developing for decades. The Republican Party itself has basically been fascist for decades, hollowed out in a virulent, virulent vehicle for the assertion of white supremacy, patriarchy, and a program of punishment, with the dominant and driving faction within the Republican Party being a highly political and organized form of Christian fundamentalism, more accurately described as Christian fascism. These Christian fascists have been organizing within and are a major political force in the military. Mike Pence, DeVos, Rick Perry, Ben Carson, these are all creatures of this movement. You might think that Donald Trump, a lifelong vile sexual predator, and this Christian fundamentalist movement are complete opposites. But what they share is a thoroughly misogynist view of women, an outlook and horrific practices that objectify, degrade, control, brutalize, and even cost women not only the ability to live full lives as people, but protect potentially even their very lives. And driving the rise of this fascism have been major changes and challenges in the international situation, in the global economy, and changes in the legitimizing norms of this country, that is, its cohering values and morality. And there is fierce struggle over this at the top levels of society, between different sections of the ruling class, and then all the way down through every social group and every class in society. Underlying this is a situation where the US, the dominant and sole superpower in the world today, faces a very fraught situation of challenges to its hegemony. The U.S. wars and occupations in the Middle East have not produced a decisive victory, and reactionary Islamic fundamentalism has gained ground and influence in the Mideast and North and South, North and Sub-Saharan Africa, and in Central Asia and Indonesia. Globalization and the new technology, the entry of and dependence on women into the workforce have further undermined the traditional and social political formations that, for one thing, have formed the traditional base of the Democratic Party since FDR. These divides have brewed since the 1960s and in an important dimension are the product of and the backlash against the 1960s. Bob Avakian, in a prescient 1998 essay, the truth about the right-wing conspiracy and why Clinton and the Democrats are no answer, and for those younger people, that refers to Bill Clinton. This essay goes into the roots and the development of the divide between the Christian fascists and the Democrats, taking apart 
how the changed international alignments, the underlying stresses and strains and transformations in the global economy, as well as within U.S. society, fueled on the one hand this Christian fascist movement's drive to forcibly reassert traditional American values. First of all, of white supremacy in an economy where there is no future for the millions of black youth, which has resulted in massive levels of mass incarceration. And second, the forcible imposition of patriarchy, which has been a driving force of the Christian fascist movement. All of this has been fueled by these underlying dynamics. And as women have come into the workforce and traditional, their traditional subservient roles of morality have in the eyes of these Christian fascists been undermined by birth control and the right to abortion and the lifting of women's sights through the struggle of the women's movement, all of this is seen as something that of grave threat to what they see as the coherence of America. And yet, on the other side, the Democrats came to represent a multicultural, inclusive vision of America. But, and this is really important, they have no vision or program that is not severely constrained by the very limits of the needs of the system to compete in a changed and fraught world, one where there is no longer a basis for the massive social programs and where the pre preservation of their system requires that the roots of patriarchy and of white supremacy be left mainly intact. Much of what remains for the masses of people who are cast aside is prison, punishment, or drugs. The Democrats have always seen these Christian fascists as a necessary part of the mix, and they are extremely reluctant to call their base out to confront these Christian fascists. Nor will they call their base, this multicultural base, out into the streets as they were in the 1960s for fear of where that almost led. And as I said, the Democrats have no real answers to any of the terrible problems that face society because of the constraints of the capitalist imperialist system today in this country. This is why only the massive struggle of the people can be relied upon to stop fascism and to drive out this regime. So it is against this background and to resolve these contradictions that Trump was able to cohere an already existing and developing fascist movement. This whole brew of contention, which took a leap under Obama, then became a, a, an occasion through which the, uh, this base saw themselves right up against it. And some of the core fascists who got behind Trump and who are now around Trump, including Rudolph Giuliani, saw in Donald Trump their, quote, last chance to cohere a new fascist order. So look, there's a lot more to say and we need to get into our discussion. And in conclusion, I want to underscore two key implications of the reality we face in this fascist, with this fascist regime. And these two points are what unites refused fascism. And let me say also that in refused fascism, we have or should have diverse views as to analyses and ultimate strategies and visions of what kind of future we want. I've put forward my view tonight, there are other views. But what we are united around is the single unifying mission of driving out this regime. Because it is an emergency, and it's an emergency for humanity, because it's fascism. And second, our call to action says, don't normalize, don't accommodate, don't conciliate, and don't collaborate. No, Bernie Sanders, we must not work with this regime. If you do, you normalize the road to horror. No, indivisible, this is not a pendulum swing, and channeling resistance into, the, into 2018 is, and I quote from our call, folly betraying a lack of understanding of just how fast and furious and profoundly this regime will change the rules, cement its rule, and destroy lives and crush spirits. To those who say, calling this, fac this fascism premature. So those who say calling this fascism is premature, I say no and yes. 
No, history has shown that fascism must be stopped before it becomes too late. And I'll say yes, but only in this sense. Now is the time to prevent this fascist regime from fully consolidating by driving it out. This is a fascist regime. This is a serious diagnosis. It is an emergency. And I don't come to you as someone who has thought for a minute that this system before Trump was anything but an unending horror for the majority of humanity. And I work for the day when it can be ended. But I am here today to say that if it is indeed true that the doomsday clock is two and a half minutes before midnight, if it is indeed true that group after group is already and will be demonized, assaulted, and cast aside, if it is indeed true that the very ability of people to speak out and to stand up and to fight back and to struggle for a better world could be severely diminished should this regime move to full out fashion, fascism, then we need to get organized and act with determination like never before. Each of us must put a lot on the line. There is no business as usual. There is no protest as usual. The Trump-Pence fascist regime must be driven from power, and no one but the people are going to create the conditions where that becomes possible. No, it is not how things have usually gone in this country, but there is nothing usual about what we face. We must organize now with all the creativity and determination we've got to prepare for a time when millions of people can be moved to fill the streets of cities and towns day after day and night after night, declaring this whole regime illegitimate, demanding and not stopping until the Trump-Pence regime is driven from power. This is what can shake up the whole country, where every faction within the established power structure would be forced to respond, and where it could lead to a situation where this fascist regime is driven from office. Think of the kind of struggle that took place in Tahrir Square in Egypt, or what took place in Seoul, South Korea, just this past winter. So reflect on everything you've heard tonight, and then get involved. Join Refuse Fascism. Get your organization or your group together and join together with us to drive the regime out. Fight every battle that needs to be fought, but have all those battles be part of and contribute to a massive struggle as soon as is possible to gather in cities across this country to stop this regime. Resolve that after tonight, that you will do your part so that this becomes a moment in history, as we say in our call, when millions stand together with conviction and courage and overcoming fear and uncertainty to resist and say no, not just for ourselves, but in the name of humanity. So thank you, and let's get to it. Okay, so we're going to get a quick word from Eva, who's been traveling the country with Refuse Fascism organizing tour. Then we're going to bring our speakers back up and we're going to take questions and we are going to hear from them in exchange. Welcome, Eva. Thank you. Before two months ago, I had never been politically active. During the election, I was in college, about to graduate, and I was hoping to start a career in museum education, which I would later find out is nearly impossible without the National Endowment for the Arts, which Trump plans to cut entirely. Throughout the fall, I was disgusted, shocked, and alarmed by Trump's illegitimate rise to power. But I felt like there was nothing I could do. I traveled to D.C. for Inauguration Day protests and the Women's March, and it was my first protest ever. I met Refuse Fascism, and I was very moved that there was an organization out there 
fighting for the rights of all people who were under attack by the Trump Pence regime. And as I read the call to action, I began to realize that we are confronting fascism here and that the dangers are too severe to overlook. I suddenly knew that if I didn't do something to stop this, I would always regret it. So when I heard about the Refuse Fascism National Tour to drive out the Trump-Pence regime, I made a very spontaneous decision to quit my job and join the tour. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> we traveled for a full month venturing out from New York um, and driving our van all the way to El Paso, Texas. We hosted organizing meetings, participated in informal gatherings and discussions, led rallies and marches, spent time on several university campuses, and made a powerful impact at the South by Southwest Music Festival in Austin. I had never really been to the South before, so I was expecting an overwhelming amount of Trump supporters in all of these so-called red states, um, but this was not the case at all. Everywhere we went, we encountered a broad sentiment against Trump and Pence. At the same time, there is a process of normalization and accommodation happening, and this is something we really have to work to challenge. But the millions we need are out there, even in the red states who hate this regime and don't want to live in a Trump world. We are calling on you to join us. It is time for us to unite and act together now before it's too late. We need to be the leaders of the thousands to go on and lead the millions in mass resistance to stop this fascist regime, to drive it from power. So, who is Refuse Fascism? Our single unifying mission is to drive out the Trump-Pence regime. We're an organization for anyone who hates what this administration is doing. Whether you're a Democrat, a Republican, an Independent, um, a Socialist, an Anarchist, a Communist, or totally unsure, if you're against the hatred embodied in this fascist regime, you need to join us. We manifest the power of no everywhere. No in the name of humanity, we refuse to accept a fascist America. We mobilize to meet every outrage committed by this regime with greater and greater resistance. Um, and this is something that Andy just drew from, from our call to action, but I'm gonna say it again because it's really important. Um, we are getting organized, working with all our creativity and determination toward the time when millions of people can be moved to fill the streets of cities and towns day after day and night after night, declaring this whole regime illegitimate, demanding and not stopping until the Trump-Pence regime is driven from power. So if you're concerned about what Trump and Pence are doing, if you see the dangers we're facing, and if you believe that we all have a responsibility to stop their vicious attacks before it's too late, become part of Refuse Fascism. I wanna share two concrete ways you can make a major difference right now. One is donating to refusefascism.org. This is a great way to become part of this movement from wherever you are. This message needs to get out everywhere. All throughout the national tour, um, everywhere we traveled, people were very deeply inspired by our message. They would see our banner that says, drive out the Trump-Pence regime, and they'd say, wow, that would be awesome. I wish that was possible. And it's up to us to show them that it is. People need to know about this organization that's against the whole regime and that is working every single day toward preventing a fascist America. Our banners, posters, stickers, pins, t-shirts, hats, and flyers make a big visual impact on the world around us. 
Our national office and our amazing local chapters around the country are busy every day organizing leaders around the country. And the national tour helped transform the thinking of thousands of people where we went, some of whom got organized into new chapters and took on the responsibility of standing up for humanity. We need funds to continue doing all of this. We want to see the image know in every corner of every city. We want 10 tours traveling around the country all at once. We want everyone to be able to get on the bus to DC this Saturday for the climate march. We want billboards in major cities provoking questions in the minds of hundreds of thousands of people. So you are needed. Donate as much as you can to make a real difference. We won't be able to mobilize millions without your support. So we're asking you to think big. We're gonna pass the hat, and if you don't have cash, we accept credit card and PayPal. You can go on your phone and you can do it right now at refusefascism.org, um, or stop by our table before you leave. And if you're watching online, you can donate at refusefascism.org. And secondly, join us this Saturday at the People's Climate March in Washington, D.C. We will be there marching with tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people who are gonna be protesting at the very halls of power. We're gonna surround the White House. Um, and protesting does matter. We are standing up against this regime's abominable attacks on our environment, and as an organization, we're building for the time when millions come together in the streets and mass resistance to actually drive this regime out of office. So if you're in the live audience, stop by the Refuse Fascism table in the back there and get your bus ticket for Saturday. If you're watching online, meet us in DC and let's march together in our contingent saying no. You can find the details and the location to meet up with us on our website, refusefascism.org. And if you really can't make it to DC, Find the no contingent marching in your area. Print out signs and order stickers and t-shirts online to spread this message everywhere. So I wanna close by sharing an experience I had just two days ago. Um, I haven't even told really anyone about this yet, um, but I was with some of the volunteers out at a subway station handing out flyers and Two little girls came up to me. They were sisters, 10 and 11 years old. They wanted to get a sticker. So after I explained that we were working against Trump to stop all the bad things he's doing, one of them said, oh, well that's good because after Donald Trump won the election, some of the people at my school started being really mean to me and I think it's because I'm black and Muslim. They call me the N-word and they kicked me and pushed me. I'm really scared. The hateful rhetoric and aggressive policies of the Trump-Pence regime have real consequences. They are hurting these young girls. They are hurting girls and women and so many others all around the world. Humanity and the planet are at stake right now. If this fascist regime is able to consolidate power, millions will not survive and life on earth will be in grave danger. When little kids come up to you in the subway station and tell you that they're afraid to go to school, it's hard to find the right words to say. All I could tell them was that I promise to do everything I can to stop what Trump and his followers are doing because this shouldn't be happening to you. None of this should be happening to anyone. The central message of Refuse Fascism is, in the name of humanity, we refuse to accept a fascist America. In the name of humanity. That is why I'm part of this movement to drive the Trump and Pence regime out of power. And I hope all of you will join us in this mission. Thank you. I want to thank
Thank you for that, Eva. I want to invite our speakers to come back up here and take the chairs. Do we need to move them? Come help us. Hey, we got a hand to help move the chairs. Tell us where you want them. But y'all can come up at the same time. We'll get it going. Here we go. And I'll read the number one more time for you if you want to text in a, a question. It's 917-407-1286. That's 917-407-1286. And do we have a microphone for our speakers, or is this this one? No, we should have a couple. This one. Here we go. Thank you so much. Can I take this out? Testing, testing. One of you guys take the mics to begin with, and I'm going to come down here so you can see me because that's just weird. <laughs> okay, so my first question, I'm going to skip asking the first question because I want to make sure we get time to hear from the audience, and I'm going to read a question from them. So, the first question we got is, if we could actually get Trump impeached, would Pence be any better? So let me just add one thing. You guys all covered a lot of ground. If you want to respond or key off of a comment that you heard from each other, there's space for that. But also then let's, let's speak to this question. If Trump were actually impeached, would Pence be any better? It's unfortunate that this is a choice you have to make. Um, I think the situation would be better. Um, from one perspective, it's this. If Trump is impeached, I think that Pence is going to be a lame duck president. It would be very difficult for Pence to marshal uh, any support for all the evil that he represents. Um, I think he would not be uh, an effective president at that point, even though he is just horrific and in some ways is more dangerous than Trump in the sense that he knows how to work the levers of the system in a way that Trump does not, certainly. But, but nonetheless, um, I, I don't think uh, he would have any power after suffering the impeachment of Trump. Well, I'll just answer that uh, briefly. Uh, I, in terms of would, would Pence be weakened, it would all have, it would depend on why Trump was impeached and was it as a result of mass struggle. If it was as a result of mass struggle that continued to drive out the whole regime, maybe that would be a step. But I do think we have to be clear, and part of the problem that we face is that the whole regime is fascist. I mean, that's what's extraordinary about it. Every single one of them is extremely dangerous. And uh, Pence himself is, you know, comes out of a whole history. I'm not going to take the time to go through it all, but this is, this is somebody who uh, um, is is really at the apex of the of the Christian fascist movement. He doesn't have quite the uh, uh, abrasive personality of um, the senator from Texas, but he's, but he's, in fact, completely in that mold and, and part of that whole uh, apparatus. And then he's also been. Uh, promoted in Indiana, where he's from, by um, uh, 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 Eric Prince, who was the head of Blackwater, and is very tied in with a whole network of, of, of uh, fascist elements in the U.S. military. And you could sort of see him standing there on the DMZ, the demilitarized zone between South and North Korea, with his binoculars, where he was basically almost like blood dripping from his fangs. Uh, threatening war, and you know, I, I read the quote before about um, you know the uh, the failed policy of strategic patience is over. So this is a very dangerous man. We do have to build a mass movement to drive them all out. Yeah, I think it's really important to view it as a regime and not simply view it as one person. We have to see Trump, Pence, and every single appointment that has been made has been made to fulfill the opposite of the mission that it's supposed to be doing, whether it's justice, 
It's for injustice. Whether it's for education, is to take down public education, every single department. So we have to look at it as a whole. I don't think we can look at it as one person. You can hold that. Okay, so, did you want to add anything? That was really well said. <laughs> Um, I, I, I would say that, that that kind of through the looking glass element of all of these characters is really important to watch what you brought up about voice, which is actually taking away the voice of the immigrants. You know, you have to really flip whatever's said, and that's where you're going to start to get at maybe where the truth lies, and an absolute reversal, which is a remarkable thing to say of an administration in, in this country. Okay, a number of speakers. Um got at the question of the remaking, and you guys were just referencing it in a certain way, the remaking of the courts. The remaking of the courts and the disregarding of the courts. And so the question that came in via text is, what if the Supreme Court is damaged and controlled by a fascist president? Do we really accept decisions, those decisions that, disport, that support the dictates of a fascist regime? Unstable this this moment is, um, and how quickly it can just shift into something even worse. So, so I guess what I would I would look at it um, this way. You know, if if our court system is is functional, you know, we do have to accept it even as as we try to change the laws. Um, and it still is now. Could it completely flip in a way that the court system no longer is independent? If the Supreme Court um, actually is no longer uh, upholding the Constitution, is actively supporting a fascist regime, uh, that could just change all the rules, all the rules we've lived by for 200 years um, and put us in a very, very different place. Um, we're not there now, thank God, but it is not impossible to get there. I mean, we have seen in other regimes that the war against the court I talked about, okay, plays out in terms of removing people from the court, and in some instances, killing people in the court, and then installing people there who are no longer working under uh, or for the rule of law. So um, we could end up there one day. I mean, you spoke to the balance of power when you were talking before, and we, we have that executive, um, legislative, judicial, but if one person or one small group gains control of all three branches, then do we have a balance anymore? That, that's, I guess, I mean, that's been a fear of mine, and it's still a fear. Yeah, I think Rita makes a good point. Um, David from it was no progressive. Um, he was uh, Bush's press secretary, I believe. He's now editor of The Atlantic. He wrote that uh, checks and balances uh, is a metaphor. And I think there's actually a lot to that. In other words, this is, these things are not fixed. You know, look, we're, in, in terms of the Supreme Court, you're one justice away from it having a, a completely reactionary fascist majority on the Supreme Court. Uh, they, there are justices all through the federal system that, uh, justice vacancies all through it. They get to appoint those judges. Right now there's, there's some pushback, but fundamentally those courts are gonna reflect, first off, what the prevailing sentiment and laws and sentiment in society is. They're very influenced, and, 
any serious study of the laws. They get influenced by the society itself. But then along comes what George raised before, which is the fact that they can remake the law. And they can remake the law very rapidly in a state of emergency. In a state of emergency, you declare that because of some incident, and then you have emergency powers, and all of that is provided for. And then you start, you can move that through Congress. They do control Congress and uh, both houses. They control the majority of governorships, the majority of state legislatures. They can change the law, and then the courts are going to be enforcing that. And not to rely too much on the movies, but there's actually some truth to that. Late one insomnia filled night, I was watching uh, Judgment at Nuremberg, which is a movie worth revisiting now. I was interested that it was actually on TV, and you can watch what the what the court they what the courts were doing under Nazi Germany. They were going not by the laws of what had been the Republic before, but by the new laws that were done by decree that began moving after that Reichstag fire increasingly uh, as the years went on through the 30s began remaking and remaking the law. And so I, I do feel that, that to rely on that would be a, a mistake for us. Uh, even as we, you know, right now there's justices who have in certain district courts uh, blocked the travel ban. I'm not confident that it would necessarily win in the Supreme Court right now when it gets there. This really requires people to be out on the streets and to be raising hell about all of this. I, I want to add only um, that the issue obviously before us now is how the law is implemented. And Rita made the very poignant point that if you're a day laborer now and you're out there some early morning waiting for the potential raid of a group of ICE agents. Who is applying to work for ICE right now? Who are these people? Who, who would be, there is a massive, massive hiring effort happening at this very moment. What kind of mindset will enter that force? And how much individual legislative capacity will these individuals assume? This is an immediate problem where the courts go over time, I think, is partly going to reflect how effectively we can mobilize against the implementation of the existing law by essentially rogue agents who've been empowered by the administration. Okay, so we got one question from the live audience here and one question texted that are very similar. I'm gonna read them together. Um, one is, why are so many, and many is underlined like 17 times, why are so many people apparently refusing to face that this is a fascist regime? And how do we change that before it is too late? And the second one that came through text is, what will it take, underlined, to come to convince normal Americans that active resistance is the best way to stop this regime? I'll just make a very brief response, um, which just could reiterate something that I said in my remarks. But I, I remember being told by someone seven days after Trump was elected that he had a friend who was involved in the hedge fund world. And their hedge fund had made over $150 million on the tailwind of that election. So why are so many people not looking at the dangers? Because a lot of people are willing to overlook the damage to these very vulnerable populations that's happening today and rake in the money. And there are a lot of people, I am sure, in this town who, whatever they voted in the election, people on Wall Street, people in the real estate industry, who woke up the next morning and thought, well, what exactly were we voting against here, this man is gonna cut these regulations. He is an entirely pro-business candidate. Maybe we just ride along for a while and get what we can. And I think, unfortunately, that that, that is really an unbelievably powerful force against, against recognizing the egregious violations of human rights, etc. that he's responsible for. 
sometimes I feel that, you know, especially because I move between worlds, you know, I move between that world on the street with the day labor, and then, and then sometimes I might be with those people that you're talking about, you know, that there's these parallel universes that we're in right now. We always have been, but it's more drastic now than ever. And it, it's just, it's very easy for some people to just continue myopically in that power, parallel universe and not look, you know, at that day labor, you know, or dismiss him as lazy or something. Um, and, or, you know, accept, you know, the bad criminalization stereotypes that are thrown out in the media um, and just continue and do those things that we're supposed to do every day and like you say just overlook you know it, it think it's not gonna knock at my door but you know guess what it will well you know why don't people want to accept it as the word word fascism I, I think one problem is that we're we're so depoliticized in this country. We know so little about history. People don't even know what fascism is. You know, when I go out and I, I refer to Trump as that, you know, one of the retorts I'll get from the other side is, oh, well that just means you don't like it. Fascism is just what you call someone you don't like. You know, there's this sense of it's sort of some sort of general negativity. So People, and it's a similar, I think, uh, struggle you see in this country when you try to talk about class issues, where most Americans don't have the faintest idea of what classes are and how they work, and they think you're talking a foreign language. Uh, because, again, we're, we're depoliticized in this country, and we don't understand the history of these things. So that's part of it. Um, I think the other is a of what comes next, right? Because when you say Trump is a fascist, that creates an incredible moral, ethical call on you to do something about it, right? You know, if I say, I don't like Obama, he's a neoliberal, that doesn't necessarily create a kind of moral calling on me that happens when I say Trump is a fascist. You can't say that and then walk away and get coffee. It requires a response. And I know for my group, Center for Biodiversity, we're an environmental group. We most, mostly work on endangered species. And when we decided after the election and, and before the inauguration that this is happening, this is fascist. We had to step back and say, what does that mean for us? What do we have to do? And so we did something we've never done before. You know, we put on a 16-city Earth to Trump resistance roadshow and traveled the country from the West Coast to the inauguration, bringing people there to protest. And in our roadshow, I mean, we didn't call it the Environmental Resistance Roadshow, right? It was the Earth to Trump show. We had Muslim speakers, we had immigrant speakers, we had people talking about Latino rights, workers' rights, gay rights, we had Planned Parenthood, because one of the things that happens if you say fascism is here is you immediately are forced to think, oh, I can't just work in the box I was working in before. <laughs> because fascism is way bigger than that. I gotta work with everybody, right? Because a fascist leader doesn't just pick out this or that to fight. They declare war on everybody. And so I gotta work with everybody. Um, so it required, I'll say this, you know, some of my colleagues in the room, are afraid of exactly that and don't want to use that term, don't want to feel that call, don't want to get out of their comfort zone and do all this, and they're kind of hoping it will go away. <laughs> you know, kind of hoping it will go away. Um, so I think that's a big impetus to people.
Well, I agree with a lot of what people said. There's one question of how do we take it on, and the other hand, what do we, um, why do people think this? Why are people not confronting that as fascism? Well, what do we, you know, even today's New York Times, you can see a picture with the no sign. We've gotten the word out, but we've barely begun. People need to be confronted and have that moral challenge put in front of them. But I think, you know, just to be quick about this, I think there's a few reasons why people don't immediately react. One is, is this, uh, people have been depoliticized over, over decades now to think only about themselves. At the same time, there's been a, a, a whole thing of uh, don't upset anybody. Just say something to get along and don't actually challenge it. I think there's, in this country, too many people do not know the lives, as both of you brought out, of, of the immigrants. Don't know the lives of the youth in the inner city. That's something that has to be brought to them, okay? I think that people don't, broadly don't uh, understand, or that people have been brought up in the, we're in the church, been brought up in the church of the democracy of America is in, infinitely perfectible and it is uh, the best system and even the only system. Many of them have never actually had any experience with or thought about different ways society could be organized, including that fascism, while still, uh, as I said before, a capitalist imperialist system, is still, it's gonna be a qualitative difference. They don't know about this. They need to be told this. They need to learn about this. And I think people have a question of, America first is, while that is the watchword of the Trump movement, I think all too many progressive people do not understand what America does around the world and go with it. It was shameful what's happened in the last two weeks and there weren't more people in the street when they dropped that largest of non-nuclear weapons. This should have Fill Times Square. You see, I just think this is a big problem that we face as a movement. Thank you for your service. You can't get on a goddamn airplane without thanking them for their service. So what were they doing in the service? First of all, it's yes, it's 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 the, the way the uh, volunteer army works is fucked up. But you got a lot of people in there doing a lot of damage to a lot of people who become these refugees and immigrants. Thank you for your services. We got to get to a place where people stand up against that. And I think, how do we, to get to the second part of the question, how do we get people to act and to stand up against fascism? I think we've got to go shock them. We've got to shock their conscience. We're just sitting across the street from the gay and lesbian center, where when the disease of AIDS was ravaging New York, but nobody would speak the name. And it was just the Gay Men's Health Crisis Center. It was in that center that Larry Kramer went in there as a, one of the leading members of it and then took it out actually on his own community and said, you people are wanting to peacefully die. This is a plague. We have to act against it. And he got very sharp with the people in that movement. And he led a movement that got out in the streets in very confrontational ways that dramatized the situation of why so many were dying and why the medications were withheld. And we have to do the same thing about the scourge and the illness of fascism and the Donald Trump and Mike Pence regime. We have to go out there and wake people up. We have to think of the kinds of actions that will dramatize what is to come. And we have to challenge people. And at the same time, as Eva said, we should unite with every protest that's going on. We should make it easy for people to become a part of the organization. If you hate this regime, you can be a part of it. There's something for everyone to do. But when you're talking about millions of people getting active, we're going to have to shake things up. I don't think we need, we should wait until there is some kind of precipitous action, as George was talking about, the Reichstag fire, to wake people up. Because it could be, and most likely it will be, not a good outcome from that if we haven't built the basis for people to understand what this country is about and is doing now under the leadership of this regime. 
So that's what I think about this, and I think it's very good that you guys hit the road like that, but we need to see that multiply a thousand times to the point where that becomes what's going on in the country, and that's what they have to respond to. Thank you for that. And I, I just want to read something very, very quick that was, again, from Sufai's autobiography about his experience of watching the first refugees from Nazi Germany in 1933 coming over the mountains to Salzburg. He said, starved, shabby, agitated, they were the leaders in the panicked flight from, in, from an inhumanity which was to spread over the whole earth. But even then, I did not suspect when I looked at those fugitives that I ought to perceive in those pale faces as in a mirror my own life, and that we all, we all, we all would become victims of the lust for power of this one man. Well, I want to build on this with a question um, that was not on the note cards, but that I wanted to inject. It's a question that is, Andy actually touched on in his remarks, and not long ago I was on the panel, and the panelists, we were talking about the new, new situation after Trump, and the panelists asked everybody, don't you see these great opportunities? All these movements coming together. Trump has forced us into the streets. He's forced us to unite, and it was very hopeful. And I had that uh, position of standing up as the one person on the panel saying, no, I find this profoundly dangerous, profoundly, you know, and, and, and I understand there's a pull to have a nice story to tell ourselves. And it's heartening. You hate what you see in the news every day and you see people in the streets. Of course, you're going to be appreciative and heartened by that. But, but I think um, in my own view, it's, it's, it's a comforting and dangerous illusion to think this is a good thing, not a bad thing, that Trump is elected. But So I'm tainting the question as I ask it, but I actually think it'd be helpful for people to explore that. I don't know if you guys have wrestled with that, if you've heard that. That's been a big theme of people out in the streets. This is our time. This is our time. We'll have four years of resistance. And, and I guess I'd like to hear you guys' thoughts on that. It's not our time if the planet is destroyed before he's out of office. Wow, Trump's really an opportunity. 
No species that is God extinct has come and survived. This is an opportunity for those other species that made it through. So we have to keep that in mind when we hear those kinds of desires to find the upside. This is a good panel. <laughs> Look, I think we should unite with anybody who wants to unite to fight this regime. But we gotta call some things out here. And just what Kiran just said. This is an expression that this, is this line, that this will be good for our movement, of the most rank chauvinism and privilege from people who think that they're fighting privilege. This is repulsive to me. That you would, I mean, I can only think it's part of one of the things that's happened, unfortunately, since the 60s, is the growth of NGOs here and around the world where people are there living through doing good and doing good for themselves at the same time. This is serious business. We're talking about the fate of humanity. 65 million refugees last year. Why? Because of the ravages of imperialism, because of what the US and the wars it sponsors around the world. And this is good for your movement? Please. Now, I, I think we have to speak the truth to people. And they're not going to like to hear it. They're not going to say to us, well, thank you for your service in bringing fascism to my attention and how chauvinist I have been. They're not going to say thank you right off the bat, but that doesn't matter because there's plenty of people out there who are going to respond to this. And some of those people who have a conscience will respond themselves. So that's the first thing. We have to actually speak the truth to people and not go with that kind of approach that what's good for our little group is good for humanity. Especially because for a lot of groups, this is really going to bring tremendous horrors. The second thing we have to do is become a force in society that's taking to the streets. That's doing something. That people see within what you're doing, within how you're organizing, within how you're acting. That there, one, is a place for them, but that, two, you're serious about what you're setting out to do. This is why I also agree with Eva in calling for these contingents. It's going to be great that there's going to be tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people down in Washington to defend the climate. But it's important that within that, that there are hundreds of people who are saying it's the whole thing that's no good, the whole regime that's no good, as Rita brought out before. It's a whole regime. It wasn't an accident that that's what we call it when we formed the organ. It's a regime. The whole thing's no good and it has to be driven from power. If they see that and they see the spirit and they see the symbol and they see the slogans, that too can become a way that we break through that second question of what will it take for people to do that. And it is important to do that now. We don't want what you were speaking of before. People are familiar with Pastor Neil Muller's famous quotation that actually describes a great crime when he said first they came for the communists and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist and then they came for the trade unionists and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist and then they came for the Catholics and so on until they came to me and there was no one left to speak up. If that's your plan, now having been told that, shame on you, now is the time to speak up, to act up, and to do what's right in the name of humanity. they're fleeing because of poverty 
or they're fleeing because of climate change that we've talked about. Everything we're talking about, it's all intimately linked together. And the refugee problem is not going away, and it's global. And so we, you know, we can't just look at it as a small thing. million refugees in the world. To understand the ravages of imperialism, you need a science of revolution. And that is something that at Revolution Books and at the book table in back that we've got, you can read about the scientific approach to society that's been developed by Bob Bacon. And there also is a radical way out of this through a revolution. Now is not the forum to be talking about that, but please seek me out later on to talk about that. Get the book, The New Communism. And, and find out about this and come up to Revolution Books. And here comes the plug, it's at, um, on 132nd and Malcolm X Boulevard. And get into not only how we can stop this regime, but how we can bring about a whole better world, not just for ourselves again, but for humanity and for the planet itself. Okay, so we've gone over time, not surprisingly. So I'm gonna ask you guys, can we do one more question? Or should we, how are you feeling? How are you feeling? I can talk all night. He can talk all night, okay. Well, yeah, it's really hard to focus in one last question. I have like, a, you know, a bunch jammed together. So um, I'm gonna cheat, I'm gonna pose two things and you can take either one. Or you can ignore them and make closing remarks. So you have a lot of freedom, okay? Um, one is on the card and it comes up all the time. How can I talk to conservative family about fascism and Trump without bad-mouthing their guy? And a lot of people have raised this in many ways. How do we talk to people who are supportive of him? Without bad-mouthing their guy. Their, their guy, Trump. And um, so that's one question. The other question, that I'm gonna insert, because a lot of people touch on it in different ways, is Donald Trump's assault on the truth, on facts, on how people, and you made the point, Kiran, I just think this is important about, you can't just counter him by fact-checking everything he says. You actually, you have to wage a battle with I think, you said the thing of might makes right, you have to wage battle with the whole method of argumentation, the whole method of thinking. And so these are, you know, they are vaguely related questions, and you can take one or either of them, but I think that it would just be helpful, or you can ignore them and give a comment that you'd like to leave people with. Good questions, and they're complex. Um, uh, let me try to quickly compress the answers to the two. I agree with you about this issue of the lying being so both pathological and strategic and incessant that it's incredibly difficult to counter. Partly because if you say to me that the walls in this room are gray or off-white, we can have a discussion about that. But if you say to me that the walls in this room are actually painted black, the minute I try to argue with you, I'm entering into your reality. And this is, I think, a consistent problem with how Trump has falsified not individual statements, but an entire discourse, so that to engage with him, you're already in, you're really in a world of madness. On the same level, how do we talk to people who don't have these opinions? One thing that we can say, looking forward a little bit, if we are fortunate enough to look forward, is part of the problem with what he is doing, what the regime is doing, is it's creating, it's going to create, particularly outside of the big cities, in places that have higher proportions of voters for him, communities that are environmentally devastated, that have no arts, where the education is entirely privatized and is therefore run by people who are ostensibly only teaching for business success. What kind of depression and despondency is going to be part of those worlds? One point, that Zweig made in one of the last lectures he gave trying to address, this was still before even Hitler became 
chancellor in Germany, but already it was clear that there was nationalism rising across Europe. One point that he made is that education really had to transform. And he thought that there was a necessity for creating schools that would offer constant exchanges with students. Students getting young people to see how people elsewhere live, to see other populations, to see refugees, to see people with different ethnic and religious and ideological identity. We can't, we can't create such a thing quickly, but we can't begin to have a conversation across the aisle until we can create mechanisms whereby there is, a, there is the opportunity within our school systems and within different kinds of community groups to circulate ideas geographically as well as ideologically and politically. I think if there's any way to, that conversation, you can't at this point begin speaking, speaking to someone who disagrees with you about Trump without bringing up Trump and pointing out what kind of a person he is. But we have to start thinking about how we're going to help these communities through the arts obliquely and through different kinds of economic educational programs more directly to think outside of their fate and to make them understand that the world doesn't have to look like the dystopian reality that he is trying to impose in the country. She says, oh, you're both first. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's really important, the point about the arts, and if we look back through history, through the most horrible of times, oftentimes it's been the arts that have managed to bring us through and have managed to enlighten us, you know, in ways that maybe we couldn't in any other way at those horrible times. Um, but I think too, I think we have to meet people where they are. Um, I know in my own family, I was born in Virginia, I grew up in the north, I went back and forth and back and forth between the north and the south, very psychotic. <laughs> um, but, you know, I have been disowned by my own family, um, but we had letters, you know, from people in Kentucky, from coal miner's wife saying, I voted for Trump, my husband voted for Trump. But everything that was promised us, none of that's happening. And now we're losing our health care. And now my husband's losing his job. And so you can meet those people where they are. You know, and, in, in, and I think we have to do that. And, and that's what I was talking about earlier about we, we've got to develop the ability to step outside of the boundaries that we're usually in. And, and go to where the people are. And I think if we do that every single day, we can get there. I think on, on the question of talking you know, with conservative friends and family, you know, without them feeling like you're attacking my guys and they may react, you know, I, I think one of the key things that we can do is show that this actually isn't um, because, you know, it's not, I mean, a lot of people that voted for Trump, okay, they didn't vote for all these things he's doing. And a lot of them don't understand those things. A lot of them don't like those things. Uh, um, so I think by, you know, pointing out to them, like, these things he's actually doing here. Look at these specific things. You know, these actually do not cohere to your notion of you know, conservative politics. You know, he's hijacked that. Um, I think that could work, and I, I've seen that work with some folks. Not necessarily that it turns you completely against them, but it makes them think, oh, yeah. I, have a, I don't have to reject my conservative vision to see that this guy is dangerous and, and damaging. You know, one thing I, I think we really have to watch out for, and it really doesn't work, um, is snark and, and mockery. And, and this partly goes to this question of the buffoon. Um, because this is something um, I think progressives are, you know, 
particularly good at is snark, snark and mockery. Um, and there's a lot to mark, to mock. You know, we've got this buffoon there. Um, I'm on Twitter a lot. I was having back and forth with, with a guy, a Trump supporter. Uh, and I was pretty snarky, uh, snarky. Twitter basically exists to, to be snarky. Um, and at a certain point, you know, he says to me on there, he's like, well, you just made me feel bad because I'm not educated. I was like, well. <laughs> um, I think that one of the things I, I say over and over again is when I see people on the right will sort of come at me with a lot of hate, a lot of hateful language. What's interesting about hate is it's not necessarily demotional. If someone, if you hate someone, if someone hates you, it doesn't necessarily mean they're lower than you. You can hate an equal. Mockery puts someone lower than you. You can't mock an equal. And I think on the left, we have to really be careful because as I said, it's so easy to mock this. It almost feels like, how can you not mock it? But you gotta realize that when you do that, I think that closes tremendous amounts of doors because people really feel like you're not just disagreeing with me, you're saying I'm lesser, I'm stupid. Um, and that's definitely not gonna work. I was, um... So, you know, I'm getting real personal. You can find out that I watch a lot of TV late at night. So I was watching this story about Lou Gehrig, baseball player with the Yankees, who I do not like. But um, I was watching the story about Lou Gehrig. It was a biography of him, and it, eventually, as you know, he got uh, ALS and what was in fact called a, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. And, one of the things that was very painful in this movie is that his doctor and his wife conspired not to tell him what he had. Not to tell him what he had. And so he kept thinking he was going to go back on the field next year, when in fact he was going to lose all his motor functions. I think that was wrong and cruel. It was cruel, but it was also wrong because People, when they're conscious of what they face, can be part of the solution. I think we have to be truth tellers. I agree with what George said, is you can't talk to your relatives without telling them about the truth about Trump. It doesn't mean you have to insult your relatives, or at least not necessarily so. That depends on your relatives. <laughs> no, I mean that seriously. In other words, I think we have to, people have to, we should not proceed from what anybody Thinks of what's actually true. That's where we have to start. Okay, somebody, uh, uh, come make the case it's not fascist. Come make the case that Trump has not been a racist his whole life. Come make the case that if you're not a racist, but you voted and supported for him, why you're not actually a racist. Now, I don't think you go right in the door and say you're a racist to your family. But you've got to draw this out. I mean, people making decisions about where they stand, it's not neutral. It's not neutral where they stand. Now, a good deal of this movement are not going to change their minds, okay? Some of them will. And maybe if you have a personal tie with somebody, you've got actually a leg up on it, depending on your family. And so maybe they'll listen, or maybe they won't. But in any case, it's not just about your family. It's about going out to people now with the actual truth of what we face and the stakes of it and who, who the immigrants are, what has happened to the climate, what does it mean to deny the right to abortion to women? Okay, people are appreciating films of, and, and the novel about the, called The Underground Railroad. Does people realize that we're going to have to probably conduct it? And, and construct an underground railroad so women can control their reproduction if, if, if this gets to the Supreme Court and he points one more justice? This is not neutral. You have to confront your relatives with this. It doesn't mean you have to be what's called an ad hominem attack. You, you know, Saturday Night Live, you only brood to this and that. That's not the point, to be ad hominem about it. But it is to bring out the truth of who they are. And we have to do that 
with everybody right now. There's no way around it. You just try to walk around these things and you get what? You get where we are. If you just, I just want one thing I agree with everything you said, but we can't approach people where they are because if you approach them where they are, they'll stay where they are. You have to challenge them. You should do it in the right way. You should do it with substance and if they're willing to engage with a lot of patience. At the same time, we have to be very impatient right now. This is, I do want to say this, because this is back to some of the story that George was telling with Stephen Schweig. There's a window that's open now. Trump has run into some problems. He's actually, as I said, accomplished a lot. In a hundred days, he's changed the conversation, including that every damn media outlet is talking about whether or not he's presidential. These are the wrong terms. He was presidential when he pointed to the widow of somebody who was killed in a raid that was a raid for reactionary purposes, and it was a folly in any case. But And then, oh, there you have Van Jones saying, in that moment, he became president of the United States. We have to take that on. I don't care if he is your cousin. Go tell him he's playing the fool for the system, and to get off of it, he's going to create a great harm. This is what we have to do. I mean, it's not a matter of being rude, but there's a, there sometimes there's a role for some rudeness. And in terms of humor, the humor is a good tool done in the right way. And what I mean by that is that humor is about contradiction. It's about pointing out contradiction. Any good joke points out a contradiction. So the challenge for your humor is it better be on the right contradiction and directed against the right people. I think Donald Trump is fair game. So is Ben Carson. There's some people there who are playing the fool and they should be treated as such. And that mockery can take them down a peg. Now that does not mean your cousin. You should go mock your cousin or be snarky to other, to other people. That's not what I'm talking about. But there's a role for humor. Now, as young as I look, I do remember Abby Hoffman, and, and I do remember when he ran a pig for president. That was really the right disrespect that needed to be done in the election against Richard Nixon. And that wasn't the only thing he did that was funny. And I think that the, those guys, and, as well as actually ACT UP, used humor very effectively, and we shouldn't be afraid of that. But we should do it in a way that targets what needs to be targeted and does not go so wide as to have people feel the people whose minds were trying to change, including people in the base of the Trump people, giving them the room to come over to reality and get out of unreality. I think this is, this is important. So I'm going to turn the mic over to George. I just once again want to thank all of you. This is really important. And I'm going to say we need to do this again, and we need to do it again, you know, relatively soon. And Everybody who's watched this on live stream, everybody who has been in the audience tonight needs to spread the word. There needs to be this forum and, and many more forums in the context of going out and getting out into the streets and seeing that interaction between changing minds and acting on what we learn. So thank you very much. I just want to say one more word to that point of humor. I agree. There, there is a way that humor can be something that strips off the emperor's new clothes, and that's to the good. But there's also the ways that Trump has presented himself as an entertainer. Right. He himself does not have a terrible sense of humor in moments. And if we start craving for his buffoonery too much, there can be an itch just to watch him, watch him screw up that overtakes our impulse to create change. And that's, that's the thing that I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about. In terms of what he's accomplished, what could, be, what could be more extraordinary than the climate of fear that he has sunk, not just this country, but the world in, in such a short period of time? I mean, the most vulnerable populations are living now with a reality of day-in, day day-out terror that is an incredible accomplishment for a hundred days of office. And that's something that we all have to try to fight back against and soothe and console. Thank you. In the 14 years that I've worked with immigrants and refugees, I have never seen the level of fear that we have
right now. I want to come back to this question of, of truth. Just like I said, I, you know, I think that coming into conversation with the idea that I know the truth, I'm going to speak the truth, what's important is to speak the truth. It just doesn't get you very far. You know, you need to be persuasive. Okay, I for one, I'm going to say, I do not want to speak truth to power. Okay, I want to take power down. Okay. <laughs> so, the truth is very highly overrated. And by that, I don't mean one should be untruthful. But what I mean is, possessing the truth, that's just like the cord that gets you in the door, okay? That's not winning. That's not the power. It's about what you do with that. And I think that's where you got to think about the power of persuasion um, and not putting people off. And, you know, honestly, it's a classic. Look, the left is full of big brain people, okay? And so we really like facts and truths and stuff, you know? It, and it's a classic, I think, problem of the left and the progressives is we get too focused uh, on being right and figuring out, it's partly the problem with this fact-checking thing, you know? Um, and there's a whole other side of it that we're not working that we need to figure out how to work. And I'll also tell you this, I look at a bunch of demographics on, you know, the difference between the Trump voters and the Hillary Clinton voters and that. And, you know, the overwhelming difference, clearly the biggest difference between them is level of education. Okay? And that's a justice issue. If you're an educated person, that's a justice issue that you can't just overlook. Most people who voted for Trump do not want a fascist. Most of them don't even know what a fascist is. And we've got to find that space between them not wanting a fascist and them voting to Trump to try to change things. And it's not going to happen if they feel like they're talking down to them. Okay, well, I want to make a comment to close us out. Um, before I do, I want to thank our panelists, Andy, George, Luda, Kiron. I know I feel, and I think I sense from you guys from continuing to add on at the end and, and from people here, there's a lot more we need to talk about. And there's a lot more we need to dig into and understand and the, and the differences of perspective and knowledge and experience that are brought to bear are very fruitful. That is a very good, Frisian and ferment, and we need more of it. I agree with Andy. I'd love to see this happen again with you guys and with others who can be can lend their expertise and perspective on this. The last thing I want to say to close us out is I was thinking as I'm listening, one of the things that people have a very hard time handling, and it's part of the impulse that gets filled with a lot of religion right now in a very insecure world, and not just religion in general, but fundamentalism and absolutism, is living with contradiction and living with a lot of variables, and living with a lot of uncertainties. And I want to say, I asked the question before about, is this good for us? Trump is going to bring all these people together and get us A lot of people like that narrative. It's comforting and it's simple. You have the, world, the history of this country's biggest protest after Trump got elected. This is good for us. And then I agree with what you guys said in different ways. This is very bad. It's not good if the planet gets destroyed. It's not good for the species. It's not good for the refugees. It's not good for the people whose lives are crushed right now. And then you have, I know what happens all of a sudden, and I'm sure people in the audience felt this when you guys were speaking. Oh shit, now we're fucked. Excuse me, we're in a church. Um, we're doomed. And what I wanna say is actually, I think it's very, very bad the situation we're in. I agree with what was said, but here's a contradiction. And I'm gonna pull a quote that I learned and, and was written, I think, in the Bush years, but is even more true now. It said, history is filled with examples where people who had right on their side 
fought against tremendous odds and were successful. History is also full of examples where people sat back and hoped to wait it out only to get swallowed by a horror beyond what they ever imagined. The future is unwritten and which one we get is up to us. And I wanna say that it's not every generation, it's not every people, it's not every body, actually very few who are born on this planet, if you look at the stretch of human history, live at a time and a moment and a pivot in history as significant as the one we are living in now. And it is neither good for us, it's very bad, nor is it doomed. And sitting at the middle of that pivot is every single person living in this country, every person in this church right now, every person listening on live stream, and all those out there who don't even know about this right now. And if we go out, it's not, it is significant that tremendous numbers of people are in the streets protesting. It is significant that a lot of people are saying, I identify with Muslims, I, I identify with the women under attack, I identify with people, for the first time, the immigrants. This is new for a lot of people, it's very significant. It is not enough to stop them. There's too much surface critique, there's too much being, you know, comforted in the smug, you know, dismissal of, 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 of some of the really stupid and ugly things that are said by Trump. And, and it's not enough yet, but there is a basis to move those people, to unite with that resistance and to move them into an actual movement that could drive them from power and stop them before they consolidate power. And people in this room, people watching on live stream, people who learn about this later, there is a movement for everybody. RefuseFascism.org is a movement for everybody, wherever you're coming from, religious, atheist, from whatever country you come from, whatever language you speak, whatever belief, however long you've been in the struggle or if you're brand new, there is a movement for you to come together with others, to learn as you go, to debate things out, and to go into the streets and change the course of history. So I want to call on everybody, in conclusion, to join us on the bus to DC, get your ticket tonight, or sign up online to be part of the contingent this Saturday at the People's Climate March. As Rita said, come out on May 1st to stand with the immigrants all over this country. And here in New York City, we will also have a no contingent you can join with us and learn about it here tonight. Join with this movement going forward and don't do everything you can. Don't do your best. Let's come together and do what's necessary and change the course of history. Thank you.